Hi everyone, today I'm with uh, Ryan. So, uh, hello Ryan, you're a specialist in uh, narrative in the video game industry. So, can you introduce yourself and tell us uh, what you're doing exactly in the video game industry? Sure. Uh, my name is Ryan Kaufman. I'm the uh, VP Vice President of Narrative at uh, Jam City. And previous to that, I was a Director of Narrative at Telltale Games, making The Walking Dead, Wolf Among Us, Game of Thrones, a lot of very heavy uh, narrative-based uh, adventure games and that kind of thing. So. so how did you end up in the video game industry? Oh, it's a long story, very long story, because I'm very old. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> um, I started it as a QA, you know, testing the games, and um, I started to get very interested how they're made and what kind of experience the player was having and how to make a better experience. And from there, I became a designer, and uh, I was always interested in writing um, dialogue for the characters or, you know, for the story, so uh, after a while, I began to write more and more and more, and then I got uh, I got into really more narrative-based games. So you started with his QA jobs. It was at Lucas Arts, if I'm right. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, at Lucas Arts. Yeah. So how did you find this job? Like just you just needed a job. I did. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a friend who was working there oh, in okay. QA, and and he said. I have this great job and you know do you want to come test video games and I said sure you know I didn't know um, so I said sure and then I came and started to work and maybe I was there two years um, doing just the QA and uh, yeah like I said I started to know the teams who were making the games and talking to them and after a while they said hey maybe you want to come on this side and make make these games and development and I was like yeah <laughs> So you became a designer? Became a designer, yeah. I was doing level design and, um, you know, for some of the very first 3D games, before that it was like 2D, kind of old, really, really old school. So we started to do the very first 3D games. And level design actually has a lot of elements of story to it, you know. Where do you begin? How does the level get? more interesting and more intense or, or less, you know, moments of quiet or moments of, you know, dramatic explosions or whatever. So I started to realize, oh, you can tell stories within the game, even without dialogue, even without... Just with the level. Yeah, just with the level. And uh, that really started me thinking about uh, the different ways you can tell story in a game. So what, uh, where this game you worked on? What you were there 10 years, if I'm right, yes. so it's a long time. Long time. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you uh, worked on a lot of games. Yeah, so some of the first games I worked on was like Dark Forces, Jedi Knight, um, Outlaws, which was a game about cowboys, and you know, um, that was really fun. And then uh, all the way through to Republic Commando and um, Battlegrounds, which was like a based off the Age of Empires games, but for Star Wars, as well as some adventure games here and there, um, doing that as well. So you, when you first starting, started to work on this game, you were first uh, just level designer on little by little, your evolution conducted you to narrative design. It was step by step. Yeah, very much step by step, um, writing a little bit more and a little bit more, and then until I was saying, maybe I could only do the writing. And they said, yeah, you know, that's good, yeah. So in the end, at Lucas Arts, you were doing only the writing? No, not until the, I got to uh, Telltale, okay. really, yeah. Uh, all the way through, I was still doing design. Um, so, yeah, coming up with level design and then doing more just broader game design. Um, and what was your best experience? In 10 years, I know it's a lot, but yeah. if you have to remember one thing that was really cool at uh, Lucas Arts. Um, so many things, wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You can have multiple answers, of course. <laughs> I think uh, one of the most exciting things was uh, Jedi Knight. Okay. Um, because, I mean, the game was really well done, um, but it was also our first 3D game. And the idea of building in 3D and moving through 3D space uh, was really exciting and very new. And that was, that was a big challenge, but also like, really exciting when it came together. 
you know that this game still has a huge reputation nowadays. Oh yeah? yeah. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> good. Yeah, so you were really part of something that people still remember now, like, what, 20 years later? Yeah, I mean, that's great because it's funny about games. They they can just go away into the, you know. Disappear. Yeah, disappear, and you, you don't know who's played them or, or what happened. So, uh, if I'm right, you also uh, worked on Star Wars 3? which uh, is a direct adaptation of the movie? Uh, Revenge of the Sith? Yeah. Yes, a little bit, a little bit. I was writing a little bit on that, yeah. Because I have a question, I don't, don't know if you will be able to understand, but how do you approach design or narrative design when someone just tells you, well, there is a movie, just make a game? Yeah, no, that's, um, I'll be totally honest and say that's the, the worst <laughs> experience, really, okay. um, to be boxed in like that. Um, it's one thing to say, here's an IP, uh, you know, here's a world or a film, and go have an original adventure in that world. Um, but it's a whole other thing when someone says you have to follow the movie all the way. The characters, nothing can happen to them because they're in the movie. Um, nothing can really change. And it's very, very difficult to find a place where a player can have their own experience inside of that box. Do you, do you know, in terms of pure narrative design, uh, nowadays, if you st still had to do something like this, well, well, we'll talk about it later, you are working on Harry Potter, but it's not an adaptation of a movie. Yeah. But if you had to work again on an, a movie adaptation, with all you, the knowledge you have now, uh, what do you think you will do to, 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 to connect the player to this narrative experience for, in order for a player to have the best emotive and narrative experience possible? Yeah. Um, well, actually, we are doing a movie adaptation. I can't say which one, but um, we are doing a movie adaptation. It is very challenging. But what we did was we created an uh, original character for the player to play. So even though you interact with characters from the movie, okay. Um, you, you are not the character. So that gives you a little more room to, to play and, and for a player to create their own story, okay. even though they are following uh, along with certain movie characters. So it's the same timeline of a story, but it's, it's something like, that happens in parallel. Yeah, like, yeah, it breaks off and, and branches off like that. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so, but still really hard. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's the, it's the hardest, yeah. So what would be the, the best thing in terms of learning curve, learning experiences that you learned uh, while working at LucasArts, this big company, when you left? Um, that's a good question. I haven't thought about that in a long time. <laughs> I think the, the, the biggest experience I took away was how important the story really is to a, a video game because so many video games well, they don't have a story sometimes I and mean, they can be very successful but still ne not really have a story um, but if you put that in there if you take the time then the fans the fans and the players will really like rally around it right and they'll 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 become that much more excited about it and um It's, it's not, uh, it's worth it to do it. Yeah, yeah the game we live after. Exactly, yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. It, it makes me thought it has nothing to do with, uh, like, LucasArts, but did you play Red Dead Redemption 2? Oh, yeah, I played it with my daughter, um, both of us playing it, yeah, it's, I love um, it. What did you think about the story? Because I really liked it, and I think it's one of the best story in terms of narrative on the way it's designed yep for the last last few years at least. what i really like about red dead is i like that it it can branch at the end yeah. so you can get a lot of different kinds of endings um and we explored as many as we could um what i didn't like sometimes was i felt the cutscene was you know the cinematics were maybe sometimes not the character i was trying to play so I was trying to do something and then the cutscene or cinematic comes on and the story's like not like it's okay it's good but it wasn't what I was trying to do in that moment so, so you, you know? had a disconnection between you disconnection yeah 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 it's a good word yeah it was like a disconnect of that okay 
not really, but yes, that's fine. But then again, um, usually the cutscenes were, I mean, they're very well written, right? They're, yeah. they're very well done, so. What, what, uh, did you try to play the good guy or the bad guy? Both. Just to... Both. Both. We did, oh. did one time we did good guy, one time okay. we did bad guy. I tried to play the bad guy, uh, the good guy, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't feel that, so maybe I was lucky. Oh. But uh, I guess, yes, it, the experience can be a little less good, worse. Yeah. You... yeah. And, it, and um, sometimes I found that there were characters that I wanted a specific type of relationship with, oh, okay. and in the cinematic, that wasn't represented. Okay. So you would have wanted a Red Dead Redemption where you can choose everything. everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next time. Next time, maybe. <laughs> yeah, they had to fit with the story of the first game, so they couldn't, but... Maybe next time. Yeah. But I thought they did a really good job of um, being a prequel to set up. I mean, it's backwards, right? Red Dead One comes after, um, and uh, the way that the story led into John Marston's story, I thought it was like really well done. Yeah, I agree on this one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, back to our <laughs> subjects. Uh, when you moved to uh, Planet Moon, mm -hmm. so to be honest, I did not know this studio at all. So can you tell us uh, what it was and why did you move? Well, uh, Planet Moon really became famous for doing a game called Giants, Citizen Kabuto. It was yeah, a very crazy game, really crazy, um, very funny, uh, very absurd, and um, they made a name for themselves doing that, and then Armed and Dangerous afterwards. And um, at that point, They switched from doing PC big action adventure to PSP. Do you remember PSP? Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> long time ago. Oh, um, not so long. <laughs> but I thought that was really interesting, and and I liked the idea of the PSP and what it could do. And so I joined them, and we did a couple of action arcade type of shooter games for PSP. And then we had a pitch for a co-op game. And Microsoft was really interested in that. At that point, they were trying to do more family games, and it was a co-op game that that a you know, and a father and a son could play, or mother and a daughter, together, and do a story that they invented together. And um, so we did that for a while, and and uh, it didn't end up getting made. But I really liked the experience of it. So do you know why it it, it was cancelled? Yeah, because uh, the leadership at Microsoft changed at yeah. that moment, and the new leadership wasn't interested in doing family games. They wanted to do more hardcore. Oh, okay. So they were yeah, like, mm. "Simple reason." Yeah, they said, "Thanks, but no thanks." Uh, okay. And uh, why did you move to this company from uh, LucasArts? From Lucas, um, I wanted a chance to work at a smaller company. Okay. Uh, Lucas was very big at that point, and I wanted to try out working with a small, like, indie developer um, to see what it was like. But narrative was less important in this company. No? Narrative was important because they had really made their name on being, uh, they'd won several awards for the writing in Giants and Armed and Dangerous. So I didn't was, know. Yeah, it wasn't, they weren't doing story games per se, but the stories in their games were getting recognition and um, very well regarded. Um, so here you were just a designer, ju just. <laughs> just a designer. Just a designer, yeah, yeah. not a specialist narrative designer. No, no, no narrative. Um, but the, the, all, the whole company was uh, really liked film and, and television, and so we talked a lot about story. And then you moved to Telltale, yeah. where you stayed for more than seven years, if I'm right. Yep. Yeah. So why Telltale? Um, so, Telltale at that point, um, I knew people who worked there because they came from LucasArts and oh. founded Telltale. And uh, I've been talking to them over the years and the time seemed right. They said, we're doing something new and big and this was Walking Dead, I didn't know it yet. Um, and I started to talk to them and thought, I would like to do something that was a very story heavy. And so they... It was a good place to go. It was a good place to go. I knew them, uh, and I liked Walking Dead, the comic. The TV show hadn't come out yet. And I liked uh, Fables, the comic, that they had also... were making a game based on that. And so all that together, I thought, this is a good next move. So you started to work on Walking Dead? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. How was it? Oh. it Walking Dead was an amazing experience. Um, at the time that I came on, Walking Dead was being built as a, a first-person game. Okay. Yeah, so, and you can still see some of that in the, if you play episode one for people who are Walking Dead fans, if you play episode one, all the sequences that are first-person were basically lifted straight from that version of the game. Okay. Um, and the writing was phenomenal. Um, you know, I'm trying to remember everybody who was involved in that. I don't want to call out specific names just because the entire team was so incredible. Um, and working with them was just incredible too. What was your role exactly on this production? Uh, a designer. And at that point at Telltale, designing, a designer would also write. So I wrote as well. Um, but I would design puzzles and sequences and scenes. Um, so, yeah. So it was a huge success, either critically yep. Yep. and financially. Why, according to you? There was nothing like it. Uh, there was nothing like that game at the time. And uh, I think it surprised a lot of people. And the television show was just coming out. And so people were very excited like, about Walking Dead and they wanted more. And we had this game that was, you know, really well put together and really well designed and written. And uh, I think it just was, you know, one of those right place, right time. Yeah. Uh, at what point did you decide to, to make it an, an episodic series? From the very beginning. Okay. Yeah, always. In fact, the founders of Telltale very much believed in episodic, downloadable. That was their revenue model. And they were committed to making every game like that. Mm -hmm. So, what what is your best memory in this production? Like of Walking, of Walking Dead. Yeah. I, yeah. Everyone has something particular with his game yeah. related to his story, or it's I don't know when you you made it. Yeah. Oh, there were so many great moments. <laughs> I think um, there's so many great moments. So one of the things that happened during Walking Dead was they needed voice actors. Okay for all the characters and one of the voice actors was actually my son oh. and he was I think nine or ten so a little kid at that time and uh, he did the character of Duck okay. and that was really fun and then the really incredible experience of watching them put together the scene where spoiler Duck Duck dies <laughs> you can kill him or whatever he dies and the voice is my kid and I was like This is crazy. Y your kid died in Walking my Dead. Your kid died in Walking Dead. Oh. That was and this is your best memory. It's my best memory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that says a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean there were so there were so many moments that um, I had you know, I was sitting at the computer and playing them and just going, I can't believe this, this is great. And uh, and the people around me working so hard. Um, yeah. It's great. So then you worked on other games that were Walking Dead alike with the same formula kind of. Uh, can you tell us uh, which games you worked on specifically? Uh, the next game that I did specifically was Wolf Among Us. Okay. And that is probably my favorite game that I made at Telltale. Um, and Wolf, Wolf Among Us, we didn't know if it was going to work to replicate the model from Walking Dead. We thought maybe people will be tired of it um, but we went for it and uh, to see it come out and people really did like it like that was like oh my god <laughs> that was good and then after that I did Game of Thrones so working with the TV show and HBO that was pretty exciting um, although you know when you work start working with HBO they have a lot of control And a lot of times, a lot of, a lot of constraints, and we would pitch something and say, how about this? And they would go, no, you can't do that. Sometimes they would say, no, you can't do that. We're doing it on the show. Oh, that was yeah. always interesting. Um, and then I also worked on uh, Minecraft. So developing Minecraft from what we know it to be into a story. It's another kind of challenge. Yeah, a totally different kind of challenge. And Mo Yang had like their own constraints that they wanted this, didn't want that, you know, like 
Um, they were very worried about putting in uh, like a main character because so much of Minecraft is it's you. It's you make everything yourself and it's all about you. So they were kind of like, I don't know if this is going to work. And I think we convinced them that there's a place for story in Minecraft. Um, did, it, did it work? I did, I'm not a fan of Minecraft, so I didn't play this game. Yeah, it worked. I think it worked. Um, we had we had a big success with Minecraft. Uh, I think when it came out, um, it was during Christmas, and it was you know uh, for for everything. It was for mobile phone, for PlayStation, for Xbox, and I think a lot of kids, especially, were looking for more Minecraft. And they found our game and thought, oh my god, this is amazing. Like, this is a whole different part of the world. Um, so, yeah. So, to come back to Wolf Among Us, it was really critically acclaimed, and people really wanted a season two. Yeah. Which will unfortunately <laughs> never happen. Yeah, I've never seen. Uh, did, did you write it? Or do you know if it, if it was already written, this season two? Season two? Yeah. Um, Season two was being worked on. They had written a lot of it. Um, and I think the team had some really great ideas. I, I talked to them initially, especially the creative leadership, about where it might go. And um, I think the team really had some very interesting... I know we're never going to see it, but yeah. they had some really cool ideas about how to evolve um, and make it about you know new things, but also feel like Wolf. Because it, it was a critical success, but it was not a financial success, I guess. It wasn't initially a financial success, but what we found was over time it kept selling. Uh, so because of the reputation. Because of reputation. Okay. So it's a really interesting game because I don't think it made a lot of money for the company initially, but yeah, over time if it keeps making money, that's why they said, well, maybe a sequel. So what is the game Telltale could have done? And you would have liked to work on, but that didn't happen. Um, I there was just a couple of opportunities for us to do a Star Wars oh. game, and um, I'm glad we didn't do it because the the right opportunity didn't come. But I think we could have made a good, really interesting Star Wars game. Yeah, I think too. Yeah, it would have been it would have been fun. Would uh, it would have been. Um, No original story? That's what I wanted. Okay. And the opportunities that we were given were not original, and so I thought, mm, mm. maybe not, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, was it true that uh, there was a James Bond Telltale Games? James Bond, we, we didn't do very much on that, but we did talk about it. Okay. Um, we were talking with the people from James Bond, and uh, that one as well, I, like... Um, I was thinking, well, if we do James Bond, we should do a completely new James Bond, like, yeah. you know, uh, African American James Bond or a, a woman James Bond or something oh, that, that just, cool. yeah, something just completely different, so that people could have enjoyed the gadgets and the and the organization and the premise of James Bond, but not be tied to, like, you to know, uh, to the movies too much. Yeah. yeah, I think you could have done a great James Bond. Well, it would have been interesting at least. Yeah, and that's another situation where I think we wanted to take more risks and the James Bond people were like, mm, <laughs> maybe, yeah. And so um, it's always a partnership of coming to an understanding about, like, look, I think we need to push this a little bit and them being comfortable with that. Um, Tales of, from the Borderlands? Tales of the Borderlands. Um, that was a great partnership. Um, really enjoyed working with Gearbox. And they were like, go for it, you know. Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. And we talked with them, of course, to stay in, in touch and stay in sync. But, yeah, they were great partners because they understood in order to be creative, in order to be innovative, you have to take some risks and do yeah, different sure. things. Yeah. Okay. So back to Walking Dead, I have a, another question that yeah. is more design-related. Uh, we are here at Game Connection, and we gave a speech, uh, which I found was very interesting, uh, where you said that you have to connect emotionally the player on with choices and you have to give player choices that matters and respect these choices which is very important because as you said it uh, in a lot of games you have a choice on whatever you choose the same thing happens yeah or, or and sometimes it's well done sometimes it's not well done and when it's not well done it completely breaks the yeah. emotion yeah but for walking dead when you think about it it's 
some kind of illusion. It's a really great and well-made illusion because everyone yeah. believed it, myself too. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, when you replayed it, you, 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 you can see the illusion. Uh, is this a problem or does it matter for you? Um, I think it's a problem when people uh, get angry with the illusion. Do you know? So um, there's a lot of magicians out there can do a great trick. And like Penn and Teller, do you know these magicians like Penn and Teller? Oh, okay. <laughs> these guys will do a trick and then they'll show you how it's done. Okay. But the way that they do it, it's still entertaining. Okay. When you think back on it, you're like, yeah, it I thought it was great. Vision. Yeah, you still have the joy of like, it was amazing. I was, I was so in the moment. I was so wrapped up in what was happening. Okay. And I think that's really the, the dividing line um, that, of course, when I was working at Telltale, we heard a lot about people would complain, well, my choice didn't matter. And sometimes it didn't always matter. But what I always looked for was, were people engaged? Were they immersed in the moment, you know? And were they... Um, were they able to complete the game and feel like I got my story and maybe they go back or wonder about certain things but ultimately that's I think where it either works or doesn't work and if it doesn't work it's when usually when people are like I felt this game was just cheating me or this game was messing with me and I didn't understand why and I didn't really feel engaged or immersed so it's, it's a thin line it very yeah And it can vary from one person to another too. Sure. Some people just never like Telltale games, and I'm like, that's that's okay, that's valid. Another studio that is doing great narrative games and that is doing choices that generally has more implication. It's Quantic Dream, but it's not true for Beyond Two Souls, but it's true for Evil Rain on Detroit. So, did you play these games, and uh, what did you maybe learn from them, or or not? Um, I, I love Quantic Dream, um, and I played most recently Detroit, and uh, I think I like, I really do like that Detroit helps you understand why or how your choices did matter. They almost go in the other way, where they're like... We have a tree? Yeah, like a tree, and then they're just really going to show you this is how it did matter, and I feel the, that the price they pay for doing that is actually on the character side, where... I feel less like I'm really playing these characters, like I really am um, any of them, and more that I'm trying to find a path through. I don't know if that yeah, if yeah, that makes sense, but yeah. That makes sense. So it's hard to have both, and I think Quantic Dream and and Detroit is is a game about exploring morality. So I think they made the right choice, but they are definitely leaning more towards this decision makes that happen, this decision makes that happen, instead of like, who are you? Can you express what you feel in the game? Can you express your own sense of like why these characters are doing what they're doing? They are showing you what's behind, in sort of. Yeah, yeah. Like like pulling back the curtain, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, li I liked Detroit too. I think maybe it was the best Quantic Dream to me. But what you're saying uh, really makes sense. It's really a different type of production than the Telltale's one, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's fine. I think there's definitely a, there's some, a lot of different ways to look at story and, and they're figuring theirs out. So, according to you, what was the biggest strength of Telltale's productions? Like the things you were doing really good or you were really proud of? Because uh, you can be proud of your work, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that in order... I think we were really good at getting a lot of games out uh, very quickly. Um, if you look at how much came yeah, out of it, Telltale, it was really fast, it's yeah. a lot, a lot. We made a lot of games. It was almost like a television production house. And we were able to do those games with a specific bar of quality, so... Um, the role playing and the choices tended to be pretty good, and um, the acting and the voice acting tended to be pretty good. The music, um, so I think we were able to keep up a like a, a pace that was good. Uh, but didn't you guys work a little bit too much? Yeah, ultimately, yeah. Like you know, that's I there, think, there was a lot of crunching at Telltale. A lot of crunching, and that's the consequence that we paid for trying to reach so many different audiences. Is that 
you know, there's only so much that people can make. And, and um, yeah, so, so the work-life balance wasn't great. So today, is that something that you regret maybe? The, um, about how hard we worked? Yeah, compared to your personal life. Yeah, I mean, hindsight, in hindsight, we can all see what we should have done. Um, but, you yeah, know, <laughs> at the time, we wanted to make, we wanted to make Telltale really big because um, we believed in what we were doing. And all the people that we were hiring, we wanted them to keep their jobs. Okay. Um, and all the people who were getting their first start in the industry, which is what they wanted, we wanted them to have that opportunity. And... You know, so so at a certain point, you're like, well, I guess we should keep, we should keep going, we should keep pushing with this, and um, yeah, like I say, when you look back, you say, mm, maybe that wasn't that great. We shouldn't have expanded so quickly, but um, at the time, those were the goals for the company, and I feel like those are those are good goals, um, but sometimes you're moving so quickly, you don't have time to stop and look at what's happening. Yeah, uh, you're just in the middle of things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Would you do it again now that you have a lot of knowledge and experience? And to be able to do it differently? Uh, no, I mean, like, if you were in a company that would ask you to, to crunch like that, oh, would you do it again or not? Personally, strictly personal. Um, I think it really depends. I think when we were doing Walking Dead and Wolf, we knew why we were crunching. Because it was the very beginning and we were trying to make something really great. Um, but if a company asked me just to crunch and they didn't know why, like a lot of companies will just say, well, we're working more this weekend and we just have to reach a goal. We just have to reach a date. We just have to reach a release. And it's like, yeah, but why? You know, why uh, are we trying to make the game better? Are we trying to make one part of the game better? What, what is the effect of what we're doing? That's where I think a lot of companies get in trouble is they just want more and they don't know why. You don't have a meaning. Yeah, there's no meaning behind it. And so there's no, if you don't have meaning, you don't have a goal to work towards and you don't know when to stop. So what will be the worst weakness of, of Telltale? Like, uh, from your point of view, of course, it's personal. Uh, Exactly. At one point, doing too much, doing too much. Doing too much. Yeah, if so, we could have, if we could have slowed down, it would have been good. Yeah. But I didn't want those, I didn't want those people to lose their jobs. So yeah. it was like, oh, we can't slow down. Yeah, it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, did you stay until the end? And uh, no, I left. Uh, I think three or four months before the end. You yeah. knew. There was brand new leadership and there was a lot that had changed. Um, and so I was thinking, okay, well maybe this is a bet opportunity for that a new management to do whatever they need to do. And I should do something new myself. Because I've been there for seven, eight years, something like that. And sometimes you just feel like, okay, this is a good time to say. It's a uh, moment. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, and go. Um, according to you, why it ended? Why did it end? Yeah. Um, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know everyone. <laughs> I do. I, I know everyone. Um, but it, to me, it's still kind of a mystery because it was so quick. Yeah. And I just no one saw it coming. To this day, I don't. I still don't quite understand how that all happened. I knew the people who got laid off, and yeah. you know that was really bad. But I never really knew why it happened so quickly. Do you know if? Uh, now found a job those people who were laid off um a lot of them yeah i know a lot of them have found jobs and some are still looking yeah did you recruit some of them at jam city i tried yeah we we got i think we got a couple people that we were working with um as contractors which is awesome um but i know a lot of other companies around san francisco uh got people from toto so finally for telltale same question as for lucas arts What is the best knowledge you left with? Um, a lot of the stuff that I, I was speaking about. So the idea that a story should be more, should be about more than just the story. So knowing really, if you're even in a game, if you're putting in a, a story in a video game, it's like with Detroit, like it's really story, it's not a story about androids, it's a story about free will um, and, and the consequences of our actions. And um, that, was, that was a good, 
thing to learn and to understand like how I could put that into a game. Cool. And then, so you moved to Jam City. Why this company in particular? I joined Jam City because I wanted to get into mobile, and mobile has, you know, been expanding for years. But I, but at Telltale, there was no opportunity to really, really work in mobile atmosphere. Um, and I chatted with a bunch of companies, and and uh, Johnny Casamassina, who is a senior vice president at Jam City, I just really clicked with him. I thought this guy gets it; he really understands. And uh, we had a, an amazing conversation, and then I thought, I want to go work at a place that has people like that. Okay, so now you're working on the Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery. Yep. Uh, can you pitch us uh, the game in some words and tell us what you're doing on the game on a daily basis? Um, so Harry Potter Hogwarts mystery is a, um, a story-based game that you basically play a student who starts their first year at Hogwarts, and you play... Uh, you make friends, you learn like lessons and perfect your magic skills, and there's this larger mystery about your brother who's gone missing, and you have to find out what happened to him. And a lot of people know about your brother, and so they have kind of opinions on who he was and who you might be. So it's a really story-driven game on mobile. Very story-driven, yeah. So this was totally new for you because it's a free-to-play yeah. and you have to deal with free-to-play mechanics that makes the company leaves, like for example waiting times or other typical mechanics, but you have to deal with narratives too. So uh, how did you approach all these constraints? Um, the f Yeah, free-to-play mechanics was really new, like you say, it's very new to me and so I've been the last year and a half or whatever in kind of a learning mode where I just say, there's a lot of smart people here. I'm going to learn as much as I can about what mechanics work, what story beats tend to work to bring people back. Um, but of course, a lot of things that you that you learn about story are, are universal, you know, and creating characters who are engaging and compelling. I mean, that brings people back and it encourages engagement, and retention, and all this stuff that you know is the revenue model for a free to play. So it's kind of a challenge to to use narrative to improve your KPIs. Yeah, yeah. And that's really been an interesting process too. At, at Telltale, we didn't look at too much metrics, um, but obviously Jam City, they have a lot of metrics to look at. And so it's been fascinating to pull through the data and say, what story things do people respond to and how many and when and did they spend money on them and like try to figure out like why and yeah it's been very interesting um is it working and it, it well apparently it's working <laughs> yeah yeah and we just released this game called vineyard valley um, which is a match three which has design renovation elements to it but a very strong story all the way through that too um, creating that features like a cast of characters. It's almost like a rom-com, you know, like a um, romantic comedy um, with a large ensemble group. And so writing for that has so been... So you're using uh, narrative to drive to, to drive people into a match three. Yeah, to a match three, and then they play the match three, use their energy to design and renovate and move the story along and find out what's going to happen next. And... Um, So the central premise is that a group of friends have got together to restore an old winery. And uh, that's always nice to have like a premise that sort of players can buy into. Um, and we knew that our potential audience wanted to renovate and they liked the idea of like um, a resort in the Napa Valley where they could imagine themselves relaxing and imagine what they might do to improve the winery. Um, And they've responded. They they really seem to like the story and the characters. You have people uh, who are telling you that they like the story. Yeah, and we do a lot of studies, of course, to find out what the, what our players like. We ask their opinion on: Do you like this character? Do you like that character? Who's your favorite? Um, so that we can know for sure what's okay. resonating. Cool. On uh, back to Harry Potter. Yeah. It's after uh, like. You worked on Star Wars, you worked on Walking Dead, uh, on Game of Thrones, and now it's Harry Potter. Like it, you're Mr. Big IPs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems I seems to have been lucky. Uh, I've been lucky. Yeah. Do Do you like it? 
I do like it. I like big IP. I mean, um, I like small games. I like indie games, but I also like games that feature big, fun IP. I mean, I saw all the Harry Potter movies. I read all the books, and um, it, there's something very, very fun about working with a big IP. Um, of course, it can be challenging too because they they want to protect what they have. And there's so, a big fan base. Yeah, and there's a big fan base, and um, uh, so yeah, it's. It's always a challenge, but there's always some kind of challenge. Um, when you had to work on uh, Harry Potter, mm -hmm. uh, how did you... Well, first question, uh, how did it happen? Do you know uh, how did you get the contract on how you went to develop this game? I don't... Okay, so that part I don't know because I wasn't there. It was earlier... It was before, it was before me. Okay. Yeah. So you arrived and the production already started? Yes, and it was about to come out, and uh, they had written quite a, f quite a bit of it. Uh, when I came on. So I've been helping from, I think, about season three, or year three, I should say. Um, um, do you know how, um, when you come to a big license like this, Harry Potter, it's on mobile, there has been no Harry Potter game since a long time. Uh, how do you approach design on narrative design? It must be a little bit complicated. Yeah, um, I think we looked at a lot of we looked at a lot of other games that were sort of in that space, like even you know the Kim Kardashian game and like some games that had a similar structure to it. And the structure helped us understand maybe what the player's daily experience would be, um, and then trying to write a good story on top of that that allowed for a lot of player agency and a lot of you know the relationship forming that's so important. Do you work with uh, GK Rowling? No, not directly. No. But but she has a company that does um, that works with us directly. Because I know that uh, one of the guy of the team, the uh, one is what's over there, he wrote a book about uh, the games of Harry Potter. But oh, yeah. year one to three, but it's 15 games because at the time of Electronic Arts was crazy. One yeah. different game, completely different game by platform, yeah. and so we studied this subject a lot. And we learned that at the time, G.K. Rowling had to approve each narrative decision herself. Wow. Yeah, no. I don't think she has time for that anymore. But, um, yeah, her company is great. And they are, of course, very detail-oriented. And they do like to know every single little thing. Um, because I think she's very detail-oriented. So we've talked to them a lot about what we're doing. So it can happen that they tell you, you can do this, but you can't do that? Yeah. Yeah, like a good example is early on they were uh, very cautious about anything to do with romance. Um, and as the years have gone on, they've been more like, okay, we see how it might work in the game. And they're more uh, comfortable with certain types of, okay, well, yes, it, these two characters could go to the dance together and that kind of thing. Okay. But that trust has to be developed over time. Yeah, you have to prove that you can develop a good story before yeah. taking some decisions. Yep, exactly, exactly. Which makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I, w I would be the same if it was me. One last question regarding uh, this game. Uh, what is uh, the thing you like the most about mobile? And aren't you disappointed of the mobile game industry or quite the contrary? Um... It's a tough question. I mean, there's good and bad about mobile, right? Yeah, sure. Um, like everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I really like uh, I really like um, television. I like episodic drama. So to me, uh, mobile feels very comfortable because I know when people are playing, they're going to play, you know, half an hour and then done. Maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, um, instead of sitting down for a really long play session. So I like storytelling in little bites and I think mobile gives you that yeah. uh, so that's that's the, the positive okay so uh, to end like to end this interview I'll ask you some more general question just like the one like Red Dead for example uh, what uh, would be uh, your dream project in terms of narrative if you had to write a game Would it be uh, an existing IP, a new IP, on what would be the subject? Do you have something in mind? I don't have anything in mind. It kind of depends from day to day, but I would, um, I love doing original titles. I think original stories, um, you know, have a way of getting, 
have a way of engaging players that it's very hard to do with an IP. And I think there are a lot of people who do IP games very well. And um, I've done that in the past, but I don't feel the need to do more. This is like, not that I don't like them, but it's like, I think I've done what I need to do. Um, for 20 years. Yeah, for 20 years, exactly, exactly. I did, I did it for 20 years, so um, I really like original stories and developing games about things that people have never seen before. Well, and in the meantime, you're still working on a movie. <laughs> Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So it's not over yet. Yeah, no, not yet. <laughs> uh, okay, on uh, concerning yourself as a, considering yourself as a player, uh, what were the best narrative experience of your life? <laughs> oh, wow. On most recently. Um, your best narrative games. Yeah, so people always ask me this and I go, oh. I can't think of any single video game I've ever played before. Um, some of the best narrative experiences to me have actually been games with not that much narrative in them. Okay. Um, for example, uh, the, um, oh my God, I can't remember it. Describe it. I'm blanking the name. It's the name of the giant monsters and you climb up the monsters and you like... Shadow of the Colossus. Shadow of the Colossus. Thank you. Not My God, me. I can't believe I forgot that. It's like yeah, sure. I used to play Shadow. I have used to play Shadow of the Colossus so much, um, and when it came out in the remaster, I got it again. And um, some, I think, because I write so much in my day job, I like to go home and play games where the storytelling is more environmental or atmospheric, and less about, strictly speaking, telling a story. So. To me, Shadow of the Colossus was fascinating because of what's not being said. Um, so that's that's where I gravitate to. Did you play Ico on The Last Guardian? Um, I played Last Guardian a little bit, and uh, I liked it, but Last Guardian is too hard for me. <laughs> too many, like, I have to jump up here, and he has to come over here, and um, so I ended up not finishing it. But. And uh, did you give uh, Bioshock a go? I gave Bioshock a little bit of a go, but again, for me, it was like, I feel like, just because I feel like my brain is already filled up with storytelling, and then I go, I can't go home and relax and play a different game. Like, I can't even really relax and watch TV or movies anymore because I see too much behind the scenes. Like, I'll go, oh, okay, so that character's setting up to do a sacrifice, you know, <laughs> wait for it, it's coming in five minutes, you know. You succeeded with Red Dead Redemption 2. Yeah, I think there's so much in Red Dead, again, that's like, I could run around and ride my horse and oh, yeah. hunt and tell back. Tell your own story. Yeah, and tell my own story. And so, um, and then my daughter would play the cutscenes and do all that, and so. Okay. So, if you don't like that much narrative games, what would be your best games that is not narrative? Um, Red Dead, I play a lot of Grand Theft Auto, so, okay. you know, all the way, way back to Grand Theft Auto 3. Um, I like open world games a lot, like Assassin's Creed. Um, get lost in the world. Get lost in the world, yeah, okay. and just wander around. Yeah. Cool. And uh, finally, uh, what do you think about the video game industry in France, if you have an opinion? Well, I mean, as much as I know about it, which isn't too much, um, you know, there's Ubisoft and they're the main, <laughs> the main players. Um, they've always put out exceptional games. And so I think France has a very high, um, high bar for quality. I think there's a tradition of art in France that's reflected in the games. They tend to be very innovative They tend to be very original. Um, I think French video games are not afraid to be different. And, and um, you know, that's something I admire a lot because it's not easy. And I like those risks. Those risks are exciting to play as well. So, yeah. Okay, on, in your home country. In my home country? Yeah. U.S. video games? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I could generalize. I'm too close to it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to put my finger on what the character of a U.S. game is like. <laughs> yeah, you're too too close to 
Yeah, I'm too close to it, probably. Okay, no problem. <laughs> And uh, last question, uh, what would you advise to someone who would like to jump in the video game industry and uh, jump in uh, particularly on the narrative side of this industry? Um, one of the things, I mean, uh, sort of the obvious, like, you know, um, write a lot, um, study movies, study literature, study comic books, of course, for all the narrative things. And I think I would advise them to um, get into some kind of design work as quick as possible so that they can understand not just story, but how players play games, what players like, how to how to message things for players so they understand what's happening um, so that they're not just looking at it through the lens of the narrative, but they're also looking at it through the eyes of the player. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Do you have uh, one last word, something to add? Or? No, no. <laughs> That's okay. So thanks a lot for, for this interview. Yeah, And uh, good luck uh, in your new job. It's new to you because it's only one year and a half. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thanks for having me. Little girl, little girl.